Yeah. You can put it wherever you want. Yeah, you can put it wherever you want. Can it go all the way away? I don't know. I couldn't figure out how to get it to go away entirely. <laughs> this one you can this one you can put all the way in the corner. Whatever you want to do. And as long as you just click back onto the slide and make sure he still has the power. Okay. You still have the power. It is a very nice purple. Yeah. I'm digging the purple. We good here? Yes. All right. Great. We are good. All right. Thank you very much. So, uh, good morning or afternoon. Um, I'm Stan Ballou. I'm going to talk about a favorite subject, lupus, uh, for the next uh, two hours. It is two hours, right? <laughs> Three hours? Okay. So, at any rate, uh, we're going to try and make... Um, sense out of this complex issue, uh, I want you to notice how colorful the slide is because lupus, uh, the foundation and the organization has picked purple as their favorite color, so this is as close as I could come. So I have no disclosures. So your chief residents, one or both of them, suggested these objectives, and I think they're terrific. Uh, these are what the things I think that any trainee needs to know about lupus, including what I need to know about lupus, and I take care of lupus. So these are the questions I want to answer when I see such patients, and I think they're uh, so. I think they're really good, and these are what I'm. This is what the talk is going to be focused on. I think you probably can get copies of this, and so at the end of this, you should be able to answer all of these questions. When do we suspect lupus? The use of tests, uh, drug-induced lupus, uh, complications, and aspects of treatment. So now we'll get started. First of all, when do we suspect lupus? Signs, symptoms, risk factors. Here's risk factors. This is, should be just a review to all of you, I think, because you've heard about lupus, you've read a little bit about lupus. So it's a disease with a prevalence in the United States of about one in 1,000 individuals. So less, about 10 times less common than, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, which is one in 100 and less common than osteoarthritis, which is one in 10. Um, and throughout the world, uh, the prevalence is somewhat similar. Uh, this is a disease, uh, as you know, of um, young and middle-aged women during the uh, childbearing years, emphasizing the presumed importance of estrogens in pathogenesis of this disease. Um, the disease has interesting racial and ethnic uh, disparities, both in terms of prevalence and in terms of severity and morbidity and mortality. It, it's more common in African Americans than about three times than whites and about twice as common in Hispanic and Asian individuals compared with whites. And not only does this prevalence hold true, but also, as I mentioned, uh, severity and mortality and those are for various factors that you can probably imagine, such as uh, access to medical care, cost of medications, other factors uh, that bear on our health care in our society. Uh, there is a strong family history with about a 20-fold increase in a, in a direct family member. So if the prevalence is 1 in 1,000 and a, a person has a family member with lupus, then the risk would go up to about one in 50 or so. So uh, emphasizing that besides hormones, genetics play an important role in disease pathogenesis. So, so these are the risk factors for lupus. What about the signs and symptoms? In most cases or many cases, the early signs and symptoms are gonna be a variety of rashes. I'm gonna show you these. This is gonna be a potpourri uh, of rashes that you have seen or may have seen or will see during the course of your professional careers. The rashes can be pretty much anywhere. We'll just take a look at some of them. I don't think anybody would miss this um, young woman as being having lupus. If she walked into your office, this is the classic butterfly rash. Note that it spares the nasal label folds, unlike other uh, erythematous rashes such as rosacea. It crosses the bridge of the nose often. 
Um, erythema, maybe slightly elevated, maybe a little scale. This is a more widespread malar rash involving the forehead, chin, uh, neck. These two rashes are reversible rashes with therapy. Uh, and we'll talk about therapy uh, later, but these, are, these come and go, and they're evanescent and responsive to therapy, also responsive to um, um, sun avoidance in some cases. Now, this is a scarring rash, and it's called discoid lupus. Discoid lupus tends to occur in individuals with dark skin, so African-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, Hispanic individuals, less frequently in very light-skinned individuals. Uh, but it's a scarring rash. You can see here areas of hypo and hyperpigmentation, areas of fixed alopecia of the eyebrows and of the scalp. Although discoid rashes often occur on the face, they can occur anywhere. Here's some more um, widespread discoid, a group of discoid lesions with various stages. Some are atrophic, meaning the areas that are hypopigmented or hyperpigmented, and some of them are active, the areas that are erythematous and raised with fine scale. So this is classic discoid lupus. Many of these individuals with discoid lupus do not have systemic lupus, but it is our job as physicians to be certain that that is not the case. So photosensitivity, I think this is a pretty dramatic example of this. Um, anybody could make this diagnosis pretty easily. You could see fairly profound skin involvement in individuals who clearly have photosensitivity uh, with desquamation of the skin. Another example of the same thing, uh, a woman with um, uh, a photosensitive rash on the face and neck, uh, even with desquamation of the skin, hyperkeratosis. Of course, it's not just the face. Rashes uh, can appear anywhere. Typically, hands are a common area. Periungual erythema, you can see this around the, the bed of the fingernails, uh, is typical for patients with lupus and sometimes other connective tissue diseases like dermatomyositis. Or erythema on the digits between the um, phalangeal joints over the thenar and hyperthenar eminence are characteristic areas for erythema in these patients. And then on the extremities, you can have a variety of rashes. Here's a bullous rash, but there's also erythematous rashes and, and in various patterns that come and go, often photosensitive. Uh, any cutaneous manifestations, including mucocutaneous, and here you see a few shallow ulcers on the uh, palate uh, and maybe some telangiectasia on the tongue a little bit. Uh, so anywhere in the mouth, you can have lesions uh, that are often but not necessarily painful. Raynaud's, I think everybody's familiar with Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, cyanotic or white or erythematous discussion, uh, discoloration in cold weather or with stress or physical activity, and so on. So much for a wide variety of rashes that are one of the early signs of lupus. More common than rashes is arthritis, <clears throat> and arthritis, not just arthralgias, meaning with, uh, with tenderness, plus or minus swelling, usually of small joints, peripheral joints, typically hands, wrists, feet, ankles, maybe the knees. Uh, notably, Back pain is not an, uh, an illness, uh, a problem that occurs in lupus, or for that, mac for that matter, with rheumatoid arthritis. So back pain in individuals is due to another cause. This is peripheral joint pains, and these occur, come and go, in about 95% of lupus patients. So it's somewhat difficult to make, uh, make a diagnosis of lupus without a history at some point of peripheral joint pain or stiffness or swelling. And finally, I want to mention constitutional symptoms. We should not ignore that some patients will just present with constitutional symptoms only. Fever, a little bit of anorexia, maybe a little depression, a little bit of weight loss. In a young individual, this should bring to mind the possibility of a systemic disease and in particular lupus. <clears throat> so 
enough for some of the clinical, the calling card clinical manifestation for now. Now we're going to get into the lab test part. And I apologize to you right off the bat. This is the most difficult aspect of lupus, is defining the role of laboratory tests in helping us make the diagnosis. So we're going to start with the ANA test. And many of you know that our laboratory has recently changed from the indirect immunofluorescence ANA test, which was a titer, reported as 1 to 40, 1 to 80, 1 to 160, and so on, and have changed to an autoimmune panel, which gives you a qualitative ANA. That means positive or negative, this or that, one or zero. That's it. If the ANA is positive, then it is reflexed to a bunch of other uh, antibodies for other nuclear antigens. If it's negative, nothing else is done. So how do we deter um, why are we here, first of all? I hate to tell you this, but the answer is, as with everything in life, money. Um, ANA uh, immunofluorescent test, which has been around for 50 or 60 years, is the gold standard, and still my professional organization, a rheumatologist, we call it the gold standard, but it is disappearing. It has disappeared from this hospital, and it's going to disappear from every hospital you're going to ever be associated with because the ANA test requires a person to do the test. The person has to be skilled and trained. It takes time, and that costs money. Now the ANA test is done using a machine, an automated multiplex machine with little fluorescent beads that can tell you yes or no. And that's the way it's going to go because it doesn't require people and it's cheap. So it is going to be the way of the future for all laboratories in the future and, as it, and it is in our laboratory now. So how do we reconcile the previous ANF titers with the current yes or no autoimmune multiplex test? Um, we can't. They're not directly comparable. So um, the beauty of the immunofluorescent ANA test, which is the IFA, was that it was highly sensitive so that almost everybody with lupus, 98 to 99%, had a positive ANA test of at least 1 to 40, often 1 to 80. Very sensitive. So that if you saw a person and you were thinking about lupus and you got an ANA and it was negative, you could say, we got to look elsewhere. It's not lupus. Let's move on. I mean, it was that sensitive. Unfortunately, the ANA immunofluorescent tests are not specific. 30% of healthy women could have a low titer positive ANA test. So just not specific. But that's okay. We have other means for determining the diagnosis and specificity. Now, the, the current ANA is less sensitive. This is a little bit unfortunate, and it is going to require all of us to be more careful clinicians. So I'm going to give you an example. I made this up. Here's a 28-year-old African-American female medical resident, senior resident. She's had Raynaud's for 10 years. Not a big deal. 8 to 10% of healthy women get Raynaud's phenomenon, usually during adolescence, so it's very common. So... So that's no surprise. Recent increased hair loss, eh, a little bit of a concern. Women don't like to lose hair. Um, and there's other reasons for hair loss. Recurrent mouth ulcers, well, they occur commonly enough in healthy people, but you know, recent and recurrent and makes one wonder a little bit. You get a, white, get a CBC, the white count is 3.8. It's a little bit lower than the usual four, but we know that African Americans in general have slightly lower white counts than Caucasians, for example. So you put these things together and you say, well, uh, what about this hair loss and the mouth ulcers, little leukopenia? I'll get the ANA test. So you get the new ANA test and it's negative. So the answer is what to do. Um, in the old days, the ANA test would have probably been positive, 1 to 40, and you would have said, well, you might have lupus. Now, there is uncertainty involved. 
I heard a great lecture um, by a famous rheumatologist a few years ago, and he said, he was an old guy, and he said, uh, we must learn to live with uncertainty. And all of us as physicians during our professional careers must do so. And the ANA test interpretation is going to be involved some uncertainty. So what about this particular individual here? What to do? Does the person have lupus? The answer is, I don't know. And you won't know either. And so you'll do your thorough history, your thorough examination. You'll get the urine test. You'll get some other tests. And you may still not know. Then it's going to become a patient careful discussion reg regarding uncertainty and the need for perhaps follow-up uh, in six months to 12 months just to see if anything else is going on. Okay, so there's going to be uncertainty involved as we work through the current ANA test assay because it is less sensitive. The sensitivity, if you really want to know, is about 70 to 80 percent. That means 70 to 80 percent of lupus patients, known lupus patients who walk into your office, malar rash, swollen joints, protein in the urine, you know it's lupus, 70 to 80 percent will have a positive ANA. Not as great as it used to be. But we have to take all of this into context. Okay, so now what if the ANA test is uh, positive? We have confirmative, confirmatory tests, and they are anti-DNA and anti-SM. If the ANA, the current one, is positive, it reflexes to these tests, among other anti-nuclear antibody tests. There's 13 of them, SSA, SSB. You can look them up. You'll see them online on, on the, in EPIC. But if the anti-DNA or anti-SM are positive, that's great. Ball game is over. It's lupus. Move on. Find out what's going on. Initiate treatment. These tests are highly specific. Almost no one else with any other disease, or certainly not any normals, has antibodies to DNA or anti-SM. You will only get these tests if the ANA is positive. If the ANA is negative, you do not get a chance to get these tests, although some of us, I think, I think me and my colleagues can order them as a send-out. It's to be done outside the hospital. And, and if you wish to get it done, talk to one of us. We can arrange it. But, it, but it, it's not something the laboratory will ordinarily do because it gets sent, sent outside. So these are the tests that you have to help you make the diagnosis. And since there is some uncertainty with the new assay, I urge you to think of the ANA test in this context. How does it help increase or decrease the likelihood that this person, for example, this person, how does it increase or decrease the likelihood that they actually have lupus? Now, other tests, once you are fairly certain about the diagnosis, CBC to look for cytopenias, your analysis is always important. We'll talk about that. C3 and C4 complement are often very helpful for assessing the severity of lupus. They're low in individuals with severe lupus, and these are the individuals where, who are going to give us the most uh, challenging cases to manage. And finally, there are a lot of other things. Vitamin D, lipid profiles, we're going to talk about this. Okay, moving on to the next subject. I was asked, what about drug-induced lupus? Um, you've heard of it. Fortunately, it is not so common as it used to be because medications that have been associated with drug-induced lupus Used so commonly anymore. Cocaine amide uh, is sometimes used, but it's not probably the most import, uh, important anti arrhythmic medication these days. Hydralazine is not the most commonly used anti hypertensive these days, but those are two major causes of a positive ANA and drug induced lupus. There are many, many other medications, phenytoin other anti-seizure medicines like carbamazepine, Tegretol, let me just say it that way, um, and other medications, quinidine we don't use very much, penicillamine, methyl dopa, and a lot of others, uh, perhaps even beta blockers, uh, a low incidence of positive ANAs. 
um, and, and actually some oral contraceptives, but not the kind that we currently use a lot. Use the older oral contraceptives, which were high estrogen uh, compounds, uh, did occasionally produce positive ANA tests, but the current ones, at least in this country, which are um, commonly used, are not so likely to produce positive ANA tests. So if you see an individual who's on one of these or the myriad of the list says about 20 or 30 different medications. Um, if you see somebody and you're wondering about it, you can get an antihistone antibody. That is not a typical one that's reflexed with the current ANA panel. And so it has to be a send out. You can send out for antihistone antibodies if you're thinking this could be hydrolysine induced lupus, for example. But the important aspect is it's usually a mild disorder. Evanescent rash, mild arthralgias, no kidney disease, no cardiopulmonary disease, mostly some skin and joint manifestations, maybe a little fever, and withdrawing the drug withdraws the symptoms. So this is a relatively mild problem that we don't see very much anymore, just because most of the medications we see we use currently are not big causes of ANAs. Okay, now we get to the, uh, the heart of the problem of lupus. The reason we're focusing on this is because it is a broadly systemic disease with multi-system uh, manifestations that can be severe and even life-threatening, and all of us need to know about what to do with the more complex features of this disease. These are them. You can read them here. And we're going to start off, of course, with nephritis, which is the most common cause of morbidity and mortality in lupus. Uh, two years ago, I would get up here and say about 25 to 30 percent of lupus patients have nephritis, but it's, that's too low. It's probably about 50 percent. And we can, and with current testing, we can identify the one half of our lupus patients who are going to have nephritis. We always start with, of course, the urinalysis, looking for more than five red cells or more than five white cells in the absence of infection or menstruation, or tests, particularly cellular tests. And we also look for the urine protein. I urge you to not just accept a urine protein dipstick, but to specifically order the urine protein creatinine ratio simple test, it's a cheap test, and it gives you actual quantitation of the degree of proteinuria. To me, it's the most important test when I'm following patients with lupus and lupus nephritis, because I don't trust the dipstick, you know, shade of green. So I get the uh, urine protein creatinine ratio. It should be less than 500 milligrams or less than 0.5. The actual ratio is 0.5, which is 500 milligrams per gram of creatinine. If it's more than that, that's a problem, and then we move on to offering the patient a kidney biopsy. Which of these half of lupus patients gets offered a kidney biopsy? All of them. And that's because nowadays kidney biopsies are done by interventional radiology. They're very efficient. They have a very low risk. They're done using a, an automated um, spring-loaded needle at the lower pole of the left kidney, and it has a very low incidence of um, adverse events, and, and it really has turned out to be a quite safe procedure. So kidney biopsy is offered to all patients, and that will tell us the type of nephritis the patient has, and to some extent, guide our future therapy. Keep in mind that half of patients are gonna to need to be evaluated in this way, and for those patients who have nephritis, um, I check urine protein creatinine ratio every three months. So once we have a biopsy and we have proteinuria, uh, how do we do treatment? Treatment involves induction and maintenance. Now, look at this for just a second. This treatment, you know what this treatment is. This is chemotherapy. This is anti-cancer treatment. No other rheumatic disease, except maybe vasculitis, is treated with induction and maintenance like we would treat cancer. And the reason we're treating this as cancer because 
I envision lupus nephritis to be as serious as cancer for the long term. So every patient gets induction and then maintenance. And induction involves high dose intravenous pulse steroids for three days, followed by one milligram per kilogram prednisone, plus one or more immunosuppressive drugs. They could be cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, tacrolimus, rituximab, newer ones, but immunosuppressive therapy in 100%, along with high-dose steroids. So this is a dramatic therapy, but it is dramatic therapy for a dramatic complication of lupus. After six months of induction therapy, then we move to maintenance therapy for at least three years of a somewhat more benign immunosuppressive agent, such as azathioprine or maybe mycophenolate or maybe cyclosporin. We have a range of immunosuppressive agents, and we're going to have more, which is fine. If we use induction and maintenance therapy, what are the results? 70% of our patients over the course of three years will do well. 30% will eventually go on to renal failure and sometimes death. So that's our, or we're looking to improve 70% of patients as a result caused to get remission of lupus nephritis and avoid the 30% who are going to be a problem. Okay, so much for lupus nephritis. We'll move on. Here's an interesting phenomenon that has been become important within the past three or four years. That is the real cardiovascular disease, including major cardiac events, are common in patients with lupus. A bit of a surprise since we're lupus patients, we're talking 30-year-old women, not a population that we usually envision to be at risk for cardiovascular disease. But it is in lupus patients with a six-fold increase compared with age-matched healthy controls. So in terms of the specifics of the cardiovascular disease, pericarditis you've all heard of, everybody knows about that, it occurs in about 20 to 25% of, of uh, lupus patients, but at post-mortem, uh, at least 50% of lupus patients have thickening of pericardium uh, by histology, indicating that subclinical pericarditis probably occurs more commonly than we see clinically. But it's what we're concerned about these other features, ischemic cardiovascular disease. In our patients with lupus, it's not just atherosclerotic disease, which is what we see a lot of, but it's also thrombotic disease, which occurs in young individuals with lupus. So a couple different reasons to have ischemic disease. Myocardial disease can be myocarditis related to inflammation of actual myocytes. Valvular disease, you've heard of Libman Sachs endocarditis with valvular deposits that can lead to murmurs, be, and these patients can be at risk for endocarditis, infectious endocarditis. And, of course, arrhythmias occur more frequently in lupus patients than in healthy individuals. So virtually every characteristic type of cardiovascular disease that you can think of is somewhat more common in these individuals for reasons that are not clear. But this is an uh, exciting area of, of research interest, and we've had our own fellows been involved in research in this area as well. So what do we do about this cardiovascular risk? Well, the things that you normally do when you treat your internal medicine patients, monitor the blood pressure, check the lipid profile, echocardiogram. Uh, it's recommended that all lupus patients should have an echocardiogram at some point usually soon after the first diagnosis for surveillance to consider occult, a myocardial or endocardial or pericardial disease. Um, and we, I sometimes do repeat echoes, particularly in individuals that I think are at risk. Some patients will need event monitoring. There are multiple other uh, techniques that are being studied. A couple of areas around the country are looking at coronary calcium. You've heard of that. It's another new cardiac um, um, measure of disease, particularly ischemic heart disease. 
and other techniques are going to be used as well. So cardiac MRI uh, ha is being studied experimentally. Um, so but it's important for us to be aware of this issue. Moving from uh, cardiovascular involvement to pulmonary disease. Since we are doing fairly well with long-term treatment of lupus, uh, in particular nephritis, we have that 70% that we're able to put into remission. We have patients who've had long-term lupus, and these patients we're appreciating now are at more risk for pulmonary disease than we imagined previously. And again, like cardiac involvement, it's almost any area of lung involvement. Pleuritis, again, 20, 25% of patients. 50% post-mortem have pleural thickening. But parenchymal disease is a more serious problem, and we're, we're concerned about this. We see this in patients. The two most dramatic you may have seen, but at some point you will see, are acute pneumonitis and diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. These are life-threatening acute illnesses, patients who are febrile, suddenly dyspneic, uh, incredibly hypoxemic even compared with people with lobar pneumonia, emphasizing the diffuse nature of the parenchymal involvement leading to hypoxemia that's out of proportion to what you would expect to see in a 35-year-old individual. And finally, on a more long-term chronic basis, interstitial lung disease, um, a serious manifestation that accumulates in lupus patients following many years uh, of disease. Uh, a small number of patients can have pulmonary artery hypertension. Just keep that in the back of your minds. It's usually picked up with a surveillance echocardiogram, which, as I mentioned, we tend to do early in the course uh, following diagnosis of a lupus patient. Well, what do we do about these pulmonary issues? Um, I think it's good to lungs of lupus patients at every visit listening for faint inspiratory crackles at the bases. You should not hear them in this population at risk, but if you hear inspiratory crackles at the bases, that bothers me. It suggests the presence or the possibility of interstitial lung disease or some type of parenchymal lung disease. Uh, O2 saturation. It's, it's, it's diffuse disease. Patients should not normally desaturate, but sometimes they do as another clue. Of course, pulmonary function tests, HRCT of the lungs, uh, in other cases, bronchoscopy biopsy, we need to exclude infections in these individuals. Uh, so a wide range of workup comes into play in individuals who present with dyspnea, shortness of breath, chronic cough, et cetera. Another important manifestation that I think you're all aware about, but I need to remind people about, is the antiphospholipid syndrome, which occurs in about one third of lupus patients, or indeed can occur in healthy um, uh, individuals, usually young women. And it is characterized by the following two clinical features, thrombotic events and miscarriages. First of all, thrombotic events. The important thing here is the thrombotic events are not just events like DVTs that you're all familiar with, but arterial thrombotic events, which are strokes and myocardial infarctions. So uh, we should not normally see arterial thrombotic events in healthy younger individuals, but we do in this syndrome. And we therefore need to recognize this because then we're going to treat these patients accordingly. Uh, the other major manifestations of miscarriages are obstetric colicics are very familiar with this. Any woman with um, more than one second trimester miscarriage is thought to be a potential um, um, individual with antiphospholipid syndrome. So more than one second trimester uh, miscarriage. There are other features associated with APS, such as cytopenias, leukopenia, hemolytic anemia, autoimmune thrombocytopenia, levito reticularis, uh, interesting rash that occurs on the extremities, uh, are other features of this. 
So what we, when we think of this disorder, how do we test for it? We currently have these three tests. They are all available here. The lupus anticoagulant, often suggested by an individual who has a prolonged PTT, or specific tests, the cardiolipin antibody test, or the beta-2 glycoprotein antibody test, since this protein is the carrier for our lipo lipoproteins in normal circulation. And the antibodies are actually probably directed at the beta-2 glycoprotein rather than cardiolipin itself. So these are the tests that we do. If one or more is positive, that person is at risk, whether they've had thrombotic events or whether they've had miscarriages or not, and these patients will be closely followed. They are high-risk pregnancies, and they are going to require some discussion in terms of what their actual thrombotic risk is. Clearly, they can't smoke. Clearly, they can't take uh, oral contraceptives, and so on. Uh, the last complication I'm going to mention, not a well, complication of lupus infection, is here because of its importance, and I emphasized it with this dramatic coloring. We're talking about um, pyogenic infections like pneumococcal pneumonias and opportunistic infections because many of these patients are treated with immunosuppressors and prednisone. Um, I think at least every patient we have has been hospitalized at least once with some infectious complication. We see it every year. We see it all the time. Um, last year, one of my patients, actually a male with lupus, was hospitalized with diffuse pulmonary infiltrates and had both pyogenic pneumonia with pseudomonas and opportunistic pneumonia with no cardiosis. So individuals can have any type of infectious, and we have to work these up according to standard mechanisms. Okay, we're going to talk about treatment here a little bit. Um, and first of all, prednisone. Um, the good, the bad. Uh, you all know about prednisone or should know about prednisone. The good about prednisone, I think it's important for you to know. The good about prednisone is that it is the most powerful anti-inflammatory agent in the universe. There is no more powerful anti-inflammatory medication than prednisone. Prednisone, uh, if you give it to a person with a fever from lymphoma, the fever goes away. A fever from pyogenic pneumonia, the fever goes away. From fever from tuberculosis, the fever goes away. Only a drug-induced fever will not respond to prednisone. And prednisone treats every kind of inflammation we have, and it's fast. It works in hours to days. So that's the good news about prednisone. You've all had an opportunity to use it, and you'll use it 100 times every year in the course of your professional careers for inflammatory conditions. The bad part, of course, is the multiple side effects. It has more side effects than any medication I know of. I'm not going to belabor you with them because you know about them. And the ugly part is patients who are on prednisone, unfortunately, tend to be staying on prednisone, and that's a bad thing. So let me put this in perspective. What's the current recommendations for use of prednisone in inflammatory diseases? And here I'm talking about lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or pick your inflammatory disease, IBD, any inflammatory disease, asthma, any inflammatory disease. The way prednisone should be used is in short, brief pulses, usually at a medium to high dose for a period of a week to 10 days, up to two weeks, and then rapidly tapered off to zero. That's the best way to use prednisone nowadays, or prednisolone or whatever steroid you're using. Short bursts without long-term use because of the side effects. I personally cannot tell you how many times I've caused diabetes in my patients with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And that's very unfortunate. Okay, so much about prednisone. Hydroxychloroquine, also called Plaquenil, uh, a very benign medication. We use it in almost all lupus patients. It has some interesting activity that 
prevents, um, that affects innate immunity. Um, so it's quite a more powerful agent than we used to think. A very safe medicine. Uh, recent, there are good studies show that lupus patients who go through pregnancies do better when they're on Plaquenil. Probably the same thing applies to rheumat rheumat rheumatoid arthritis patients. Um, patients are less likely to have flare-ups of kidney disease. So Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine is a good choice. Immunosuppressives for everybody with serious disease, including nephritis, including chronic lung disease. There's a wide range of immunosuppressive agents available we have at our fingertips now. You've heard of them, azathioprine, mycophenolate, methotrexate, and so on. We use them, but carefully, realizing the risk of infection. We're beginning to develop targeted therapies. You may have heard of belimumab, which is targeted against anti-B lymphocyte stimulator, a molecule that stimulates B lymphocytes to make them make autoantibodies. So this is the first targeted therapy, therapy approved. As of today, if you go on to uh, clinicaltrials.gov, there are over 100 trials underway in the United States for new therapies to treat lupus. Most of these are targeted, anti-cytokine, anti-B cell, anti-T cell, and so on. And finally, then, I want to leave you with this thing that we must not forget, which is treating lupus patients is more than just prednisone or Plaquenil or an immunosuppressive agent. It is a vast range of controlling all of the symptoms and manifestations they have using blood pressure, monitoring, ACE inhibitors, you see it on here, calcium, vitamin D, statins, because of the cardiovascular risk, maybe baby aspirin, contraception, discussion for every woman who has nephritis, sunscreens, and, and many other things, pneumococcal vaccination, zoster vaccination, flu vaccination, topical steroids, and the list goes on and on and on. So a complex like this disease requires truly uh, a great deal of internal medicine management. And I'll stop there. I hope this um, answered the questions that uh, we addressed at the beginning uh, or any other questions that you have at the present time. Yes? One question. Was, was there any role of IL-1 inhibition for patients with lupus and cardiovascular disease? Uh, not clear yet. We can. We have inhibitors of IL-1. Uh, some of them are quite, we've used them for rheumatoid arthritis, we've used them for um, childhood arthritis and some other vascular diseases. Uh, th they're being looked at in lupus. Nothing I know of yet that suggests that inhibition of IL-1 will be very effective, but we're going to find out. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you. You bet. Did I wrap it up and tell you? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Good timing. I can't talk to yeah. question. I think I may have asked you before. Do you still have Miss Samaru? Who do I want? Do you still have